so I'm Alex Nickel from Arisa Networks. Uh, 15 minutes I think I have here, and I'm just going to talk about uh, where Arista perceived the evolution of Merchant Silicon. So I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with Merchant Silicon. A lot of the times we talk about it from a switching perspective. I want to kind of cover where we think it's going to go and actually start overlapping with what we might traditionally term as a router. Before I go into that, just a quick background of who is not familiar with Arista. Uh, it's a company founded in 2004, first product well in 2008. We're now a public trading company, uh, went IPO in 2014. We build obviously switches and routers, uh, but those switches and routers are, are all very much focused on that adoption we see from 10 gig, 40 gig, and 100 gig, right? So high speed switches and routers we're focused on. And that's really allowed us to really leverage ourselves in some of the transitions we're seeing inside the data center, right? Where there's been a massive uptake in 10 gig and 40 gig. From a strategy perspective, we're, we're built on two basic pillars. Uh, one is the fact that as much as we build the switches and routers themselves, we don't build the silicon that sits in there. So what we actually go to is third parties and actually allow them to develop the silicon and then we build the switches around their silicon, right? So that's the merchant silicon piece of the story. And then over the top of that multiple different pieces of silicon, we then run a very open programmable operating system, right? It's a full unmodified Linux kernel there, multiple APIs to allow you to program and extend the actual capability of the switch. So you can see that that approach in terms of 10 gig density, 40 gig density, has really allowed us to actually grow our market share massively inside the data center itself, right? So we're roughly running 2%, 3% market share per year to the point now, if you look at 2016, first half, we roughly got about, about 14% market share on DC. So as I go through this present, what do I mean when I talk about merchant silicon? So kind of you look at our traditional approach to a networking vendor's traditional approach to building ASICs as we would term it, right? When they design it, it's very much a top-down approach where you're, what you're doing is you're designing it based on the requirements, right? The application requirements. And from the application requirements, you're going to take a number of predefined cells to create that functionality. At that point in time, you've created your requirements, you've created your net list. What you then do as a network vendor, you then outsource the development or sorry, the production of the silicon to a third party. Right? And the point being here is by doing it a top-down approach, it's quicker to market and it reduces the amount of cost and also leverages the cost across multiple different vendors, right? From a networking vendor plus also the silicon, the silicon vendor is manufacturing it for you. When we talk about a full customer design, it's the other way around. When we talk about full customer, what we're actually doing is we're designing the chip from the ground up. Right? So we're actually looking at, at a component level instead of at a, at a block level. And by looking at a pair component level, a low level component level, we can now optimize the clock speed, the performance, the power, right? And how much functionality can actually squeeze into the silicon itself. Right. Now, historically, that would be, as you'd expect, although that gives you the maximum performance, historically, it's a, it's a longer process, and it can be a very costly process for a networking vendor to do. So this is where the merchant piece comes into place. So what actually happens is actually, it's not the networking vendor who actually does all this work. It's actually done by a dedicated silicon vendor, right? So what you might be familiar with, Broadcoms, Intels, Fulcrums, Junes, they actually build the whole chip. And by making use of their fabrication techniques, you're now going to be able to reduce your cost, and you're going to be actually now to the point where you actually can almost create Moore's Law in terms of development of silicon. So you're almost doubling the silicon speed throughput in every two years using those fabrication techniques, while at the same time reducing cost. <coughs> So that's what we mean by when we talk, a lot of times we talk about merchant silicon, but what we really mean is a full custom design approach and a merchant silicon vendor actually developing the silicon themselves. But even though merchant silicon is going to give you the optimum performance, right, it's still going to be a trade-off, right? You can't, there's no unicorn piece of silicon that's going to do everything. So you have to put a trade-off on what actually your requirements are, right? From how many pins you want to put on the piece of silicon, so how many pins are going to define how many physical ports are going to end up on the switch, Okay, what speed do you want those pins to run at? So whether they're going to run at 10 gig, whether they're going to run at 25 gig, to give you 25 and 100 gig support. And then buffers, right? So buffers, another great question is, as you can see from this layout here, buffers take a lot of space on the chip, right? So the question is, how large do you want the buffers? Do you want them large to the point, actually, I want to increase them, so I'm going to do them off, off chip. If we do off them off chip, I have to get access to that resources, right? If we get access to the right resources, I mean I'm going to have to consume more pins on the chip, which means I'm going to have less ports on the chip. Right? And then we come down to the, the logic, right? How much forwarding logic you want, what layer 2, layer 3 functionality you want. Again, it takes up real estate on the, on the silicon. 
And then, as we'd expect, there's this whole forwarding tables again, take up real estate in the Silicon. So how many, how large do you want the forwarding table to be? From a Mac table perspective, along with prefix Mac perspective, and TCAM, right? So again, it's all a balancing act. So this is why, if you kind of look at where what's happened inside the data center itself. So from a data center perspective, we've seen a massive growth in the uptake of 10 gig, and all of that's down to Moore's law being enacted in CPU, right? So CPU performance has doubled every two years, which has allowed more VMs to put on the, on the CPUs, which then increased the amount of bandwidth demands inside the data center. Right, so where we've actually seen the adoption of 10 gig now is a standard piece of connection from the server. Next two to three years, that 10 gig is going to actually supersede by 25 gig. And the upshot of this from a networking perspective is simply the fact to keep up with this adoption rate, the only option and now the de facto standard inside the data center itself has been merchant silicon based switches. All right, if you're increasing your throughput of your server every two years, you're going to have to double the density of your switches at the same point. And the only way to keep up with that is that merchant silicon approach to the solution. And if you kind of look at the timelines of where silicon's actually developed itself, merchant silicon's developed itself, it's actually achieved Moore's law over the, over the last eight to ten years. Right, where we, if you look at from a 2008 perspective, with the first piece of merchant silicon came out, from Intel, it was a 24 port 10 gig switch on a single piece of silicon. Then, probably more familiar with, the Trident 2 or the Trident Plus chipset, it then doubled that actually to provide you with a single piece of silicon, 64 ports of 10 gig. And then from there, Trident 2, we've doubled it again, 128 ports of 10 gig. And now we're seeing the latest from Broadcom, which is the Tomahawk chip, right? Tomahawk chip has actually got 128 pins, the same as T2, but now the pins are running, instead of running at 10 gig, they're now running at 25 gig. So that now allows you to have the chip running 120 ports of 25 gig or 32 ports of 100 gig in a single chip. Okay. So we're probably all familiar with the Broadcom chip set, but what's probably more important at the same time here is because the target market here is increases, increased, increased inside the data center and outside the data center from Merchant Silicon, we're actually seeing more and more pieces of silicon being developed. Right? So we talk a lot about Trident, it's very much focused for top of the rack switches. But we've now got June producing the Petra, the RAD, Jericho chipsets, which are very much based for 100 gig and multi-chip uh, multi chassis-based designs. And even now, 2006, we're now seeing the, the introduction of Vicarium with not only a 100 gig, 25 gig chip, but also a fully programmable pipeline, right? So this is a very healthy market, and it's now becoming more and more competitive because the market's getting larger. And it, the development cycle is not gonna stop any, any, any time soon. Right? If you look at the latest silicon, it's running on 20 nanometer technology. The latest, the next generation of silicon is going to be running at 16 nanometers. And then we go from 16 down to 7 nanometers. And then from 7 nanometers in the 2020 range, we're talking about 5 nanometers. And with each of those technologies, we're going to increase the density on the chip, right? The amount of functionality you can put on the chip, the amount of uh, table size you can put on the chip, the throughput of the chip. And this is almost increasing, as I say, every two years. And as you're increasing density, because you're doing it in a single chip, you're not increasing your cost per bit either. Right. So, to my point, that's very much been accepted as the way forward from a switching perspective, right? And that's why you've seen the massive adoption of merchant silicon inside the data center at the top of the rack and potentially at the spine layer as well, right? Where you've needed high density 10 gig, high density 40 gig, and 100 gig, but not very large tables, right? Which is seen as a domain of a router, large tables and very complicated uh, techniques in terms of layer 2, layer 3 functionality, MPLS, encapsulation technologies. So it's very much to this point where we've looked at a router being the domain of a network vendor's own propriety in-house in chipsets or, in, or own ASICs. But with the latest silicon, that, that line is now becoming more and more blurred. All right, so if I take the RAD uh, chipset, or the June chipset, I should say, that's very much targeted at the routing market now. So if we look at the iterations of June, we've had first generation, or second generation, you want to call it, in 2014. Right? Single chip was sporting six ports of 40 gig. Six ports of 40 gig, 64K routes, right? Again, not sufficient to be a full internet router. Next generation, last year, introduced last year, the Jericho chipset. We're now talking about a single chip, six ports of 100 gig. 
But what was more important with six ports of 100 gig, but now in hardware, they can now support an entire internet routing table. Not only can they support that, the complex of the forwarding tables now allowing us to do MPLS functionality, VXLAN functionality, encapsulation technologies. So the technology, the forwarding technology is increasing, the size of the tables is increasing, while well, the throughput is increasing at the same time. Right, and this again, this is not going to stop. Next generation again, Jericho Plus, you're now looking at nine ports of 100 gig. And then 2018 plus, 2020, you're going to see what's called Jericho 2, and at that point in time, we're now talking about 400 gig technology on the chip. Right, again, as we increase the speed and the throughput of the chips, we're also going to be increasing the amount of table sizes in the chip as well. So what, is, what does that kind of all mean in the real world today? Right? So if you look at our, our Arista product portfolio, so on the left-hand side here, what you have is our 7500 range. So 7500 range, it was built around the RAD chipset. Right? So if you remember RAD, six ports of 40 gig. So that allowed us in a single slot of a chassis to give you 36 ports of 100, uh, 36 ports of 40 gig, sorry. Right? Or in a single one U, using a multi-chip RAD design at the bottom, we could do four ports of 10 gig and multiple ports of 100 gig. Now with the latest Jericho chipset, we've actually just taken the same line card, 36 ports on it now, but now those 36 ports are 36 ports of 100 gig. If we look at the one U uh, footprint now, you're now talking about a single one one U. This is a single multi chip, single chip here, and you now have 48. This is actually sorry, that's a mistake. There should actually be 48 ports of 100 gig in it, right? 48 ports of 100 gig, and eight ports of 40 gig inside a single chip. Well, at the same time, you've increased the throughput. The actual table size is also increasing as well, right? So now those boxes with that 100 gig support. You're now talking about a full internet routing table. A lot more complicated uh, layer two, layer three logic. So now you have full MPLS support, EVPN support, VXLAN support, MPLS SR support. Right? And because these are all, well, you're increasing the density well at the same time reducing your cost by having less chips, the cost per port is going down as well. Right? So as we double the density, we're not actually doubling the cost. Again, Moore's law, what we've seen in the server, we're now seeing in networking as well. So if you want to hear any more, we're, we're outside. Uh, we can actually give you a access to our software to actually run routers on, in a VM if you want. So actually our software, we can actually package it up itself inside a VM, and you can actually test the software itself, all the functionality as a VM. So if you're interested, come out, we're outside, we can give you a copy of the software. Okay, thank you very much.